So this is a bilingual class, which we're really excited to be able to teach this in both English and Spanish. Um, so some logistical things, if you have some questions, put it in the chat. Esta clase va a ser bilingüe, vamos a hablar en inglés y también en español. Y si tienen preguntas, por favor, póngalas en el chat y, y, y podemos responder tal vez al final o si tenemos un momento, podemos también respond responder así en el chat. Um, so if we have time, we'll address it in the moment, um, but we will have some time at the end for Q&A. Um, vamos a empezar con, con una encuesta. Um, queremos saber si hablas español. So we're going to start with a poll and we want to see um, where our Spanish speakers at. And that will kind of inform us whether we should do a little bit of Spanish a lot. Um, we are going to be sharing this, so we do want to still do Spanish even if we don't have any Spanish speakers today. So I'm going to launch that first poll. Estamos empezando la encuesta. Y por favor, díganos si hablan español, sí o no. Um, do you speak Spanish, yes or no? And you can answer both. If you are bilingual, um, we have some bilingual people on the call. <laughs> Pero bienvenidos todos. Um, en mientras que están respondiendo a la pregunta, este, quiero presentar a las presentadoras. Um, so we have three presenters today. I will be your moderator. My name is Cindy Hu, and I work with Watershed Management Group. I'm the Community and Youth Education Manager. And we are joined today by three amazing presenters. Um, we have Christian, who is one of the docents at Watershed Management Group. And then we have uh, Perrin and also Francesca from Borderline Restoration Network. Um, so you can go ahead and introduce yourselves. They did wave hello, but I want them to, to say hi. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is Christian. And uh, I am a docent at Watershed Management Group. Soy docente en Watershed Management Group y estoy estudiando mi maestría de en, en arquitectura del paisaje, landscape architecture master's degree. Um, just the first year. <laughs> so I'm on it and I love everything related with plants and that's why I'm here. Hi everyone, hola a todos. Uh, my name is Francesca Clavery. I am the um, Native Plant Program Manager for Borderlands Restoration Network. Uh, me llamo Francesca Clavery y soy el gerente del programa de plantas nativas para el Borderlands Restoration Network. Gracias por estar aquí. Hi everybody, my name is Perrin uh, and I'm the Assistant Manager for the Native Plant Program. And I do a lot of the um, coordination for our seed collection efforts. Thank you. So they will be presenting all you need to know about collecting, saving, and germinating seeds. And uh, Christian is going to be helping out with some Spanish translation. I'll be jumping in there too. Um, but we are going to do the best. Um, it is a bilingual class, so we're going to jump in and do a little bit of both. So please bear with us. Um, if you're not a Spanish speaker, we want this um, class to be accessible to everyone. So um, vamos a hablar en inglés y también en español. Así que demos un momento para hacerlas, uh, para traducir lo que estamos platicando porque queremos uh, conectar con la, la audiencia que habla español. Um, so yes, so please bear with us. Okay, thank you for doing the poll. It looks like we have some Spanish speakers, which is exciting. Uh, me gusta ver que tenemos algunos que hablan español. Okay, so I'm going to start with our 50-year vision for Watershed Management Group. Um, if you are from Tucson or even if you're a transplant like me, um, you might have driven over an overpass in Tucson. And if you look over, it looks really dry, um, not a lot going on, um, but our 50-year mission, which is re really ambitious, is to restore these rivers in Tucson. We want to get flowing rivers um, all across Tucson and that will revitalize the area and bring new life, bring new animals, and just really create awesome habitat for, for critters, um, such as beavers, which is one of our other initiatives. So this is our, our 50 year vision, and we're really excited about um, trying to restore flows to Tucson. 
Cristian, do you mind doing our Spanish translation for our vision? Ah, uh, sí. Y no puedes cerrar allá abajito, Cindy, donde dice when to collect something that didn't download or something. No sé qué se va. No se pudo bajar. Nomás para no estarlo viendo. Let me try. Ok. Uh, en el 2013, Washington Management Group estableció como su visión a 50 años el restaurar la herencia de ríos y arroyos fluyendo en Tucson. ¡Ah! Se fue. <ríe> uh, se fue la presentación. <ríe> y no me lo sé de memoria. Sorry. <ríe> Ok, sabíamos que esta visión es hidrológicamente posible y empezamos a ver un cambio de paradigma en el manejo de nuestra agua y el desarrollo de nuestra ciudad. ¿Cómo se ve esta visión en la realidad uh, con la desaparición histórica de nuestros ríos y el crecimiento urbano exponencial? Es difícil poder imaginarnos esta visión. Comisionamos a Dennis Caldwell, un artista y naturista local, para ayudarnos a traer esta visión a la vida en seis lugares icónicos en la cuenca de Tucson. Y estas son las imágenes que nos muestran cómo se vería nuestro río restaurado en el desierto, con un flujo, flujo poco profundo que se serpentea por el lecho del río, sirviendo a la naturaleza y a la gente. Gracias. Um, so these were the images that we refer to in Spanish, we didn't refer to in the English vision, um, but this is what that might look like, us restoring these flows in Tucson will create that habitat, those homes that I was talking about. Um, so you see the, the beaver here in the bottom right hand corner, they're just so cute. And we even have a bird and we have a beautiful dam here. And it's just amazing to, to think that our Tucson rivers could look like this. And so, um, yes, we did commission um, Dennis Caldwell to um, envision what that might look like. And so um, that's what these images are. And like I mentioned before, with the overpass, if you drive over the overpass, if you look over, it looks dry, but this is what it might look like if we had flowing rivers. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Borderlands Restoration Network to introduce a little bit about their organization. Hey everyone. So I'm gonna give an a really quick overview of what Borderlands Restoration Network does. And then I'm gonna touch briefly on our native plant program and our propagation efforts and some basic uh, seed propagation, uh, cause it's so cool. But then we're gonna leave the rest of the time for Perrin to specifically talk about um, seed collecting cause that's how we really advertise the class. And we've never really done a seed collection class or really offered it. Um, so yeah, we like really wanna get that underway. Um, Christian, do you wanna, translate that or do you want me to go through the whole slide how do you want me to stop for translations um go to the, the all the the slides okay uh so borderlands restoration network we started in 2012 and our our mission is to reconnect people to the environment and to nature through ecological restoration and with that we have three main aspects to our organization uh, we do our watershed restoration work which is what's here in this photo where we do a lot of rock work, erosion control rock work. Um, and we work in different watersheds, mostly in Southern Arizona and also have some projects in Northern Sonora. We have a fantastic education program. Uh, this is partly like these types of workshops, um, but most importantly, we pay youth in the borderlands, specifically in rural communities uh, to do this kind of restoration work. So this photo that's here is from uh, some of the paid Patagonia high school students. Um, and this summer we're starting up a field school in Sonora, which is really exciting. Um, and our goal is to just teach people about uh, the environment, about native plants and about erosion control work. Um, we also have a cool mesquite stewards program where uh, I think Juliet is on this call who heads that up, but it, it's really cool and just gets people enthused about mesquites and learn about some of the the stressors and some of the really cool parts of mesquites in the landscape. Um, and then we have our native plant program where we have a seed lab that goes out and collects seeds uh, in the wild. We have a nursery where we propagate native plants. Um, and then we do 
we have all kinds of different projects like oak restoration projects, uh, a wild crop relatives projects, um, agave, a lot of agave and bat work. Um, we, we do, we have like all kinds of different really fun projected theme uh, uh, things that we work on. Um, but today we're gonna talk about the propagation and the seed collection. Muy bien. Ok, lo que Frances, Francesca dijo, ella trabaja con Border Large Restoration Network y esta organización me encanta, están en Patagonia, Arizona, ellos trabajan con, uh, tienen distintos programas, ¿no? Pero es sobre todo para uh, restauración de cuencas con estructuras de rocas, como vemos ahí en la imagen. Eh, también tienen programas de educación donde trabajan con uh, jóvenes de pre Preparatoria. Eh, también tienen un invernadero de plantas que me encanta ir ahí. Es un peligro si voy porque quiero comprar todo. <risa> eh, y también enseñan a la gente a, a cosechar, a colectar las semillas que se encuentran en, en las áreas naturales, ¿no? Tienen muchos programas, hacen muchas cosas bien fascinantes, también trabajan con murciélagos. Bueno, no podría terminar de... Nos vamos a tomar toda la hora aquí, ¿no? Entonces los invito a que lo googleen y, y chequen su página, está bien padre. So the mission of our native plant program is to promote biodiversity by providing access to restoration quality native plant materials. Native plants have edible, medicinal, and aesthetic value and support basic ecosystem function. We seek to heal the land and ourselves by exploring a culture of place centered on a rich relationship with our native flora. Um, nuestra misión es promover la biodiversidad proporcionando acceso a restauración de calidad con materiales de plantas nativas. Las plantas nativas tienen valor estético, son comestibles y medicinales, a su vez aportan funciones básicas del ecosistema. Buscamos sanar la tierra y a nosotros mismos explorando la cultura del lugar, enfocándonos en una relación rica con nuestra flora nativa. So, what I want to talk about, we're going to focus on specifically seed work. And with the seed work, um, there's many ways to propagate plants and many different ways to get plants um, in the landscape. You have seeds, but you can also do things clonally. We use seeds because um, seeds are pollinated. Um, plants can't walk around. They still need to have sex if they're gonna produce seeds. So they do this through wind. They do this through all kinds of different pollinators with the idea of being able to move genetics through the landscape so that they can come up with this like perfect uh, baby, a, a little seed. Uh, so um, yeah, I'm gonna try and get through these quickly. So go for it, Christian. Pues básicamente es lo que está en la imagen, ¿no? Eh, cuando una planta es polinizada, pues tiene que tener su flor, ahí va la abejita, se mete y ahí anda merodeando en la florecita, entonces sucede la polinización um, y esto hace que, que genere un, un fruto, ¿no? Y, y del fruto se genera la semilla, básicamente es, es eso, ¿no? Es, si queremos colectar semillas, es una buena señal. <laughs> La primera señal es ver una flor. Puede seguir, Francesca. Something that we do with our plant propagation and seed collection is we take very meticulous notes. So here's an example of what some of our accession numbers and propagation numbers look like. Mostly because we partner with a lot of federal agencies and we want to look real fancy and show them all the stuff that we collect while we're out there but it also allows land managers to know like exactly where the seed is from, what the GPS coordinates are, what watershed it's from, what elevation it was found at, all of that information. When you're out doing anything with plants, uh, you don't have to have an accession number per se, but you should really write stuff down. And to this day, uh, I, I think I'm gonna remember something or like I'm working with a cool plant that I'm like, oh, I'll totally remember this in like a few days and then write it down. And you like something that I'm not a very, I'm not a super organized person. So uh, especially for those of you that are unorganized, write everything down because it will help you with plants. Yeah, it's, it's very important. 
Sí, lo que Francesca dice es que debemos de ser organizados y vamos a estar colectando semillas así en, en, el, en la naturaleza. Eh, híjole, pues tenemos que marcar bien, ¿no? Eh, ¿Qué semilla fue? Y no pensar, ah, no se me va a olvidar, este, al rato lo, lo anoto ya que llegue a la casa o no. <ríe> Anótalo ahí mismo porque sí se te va a olvidar. Entonces, pues vemos muchas semillas y pues ya luego no sabemos qué tenemos, ¿no? Entonces ellos, eh, como Border Art Restoration, tienen muy organizado su registro de dónde sacan las semillas, a dónde van, hasta con coordenadas y, y toda la cosa. Está muy bien. This slide I think is really cool because we use it to show provenance of uh, how, how native plants kind of exist in the landscape. So this is a map of the Sky Island region. You can see Tucson is the little black dot kind of in the upper left-hand corner about uh, Patagonia, Nogales, or you know, way south of that. But all the fuchsia uh, areas that are colored in uh, is of a distribution map of Penstemon Barbados, which is a beautiful, beautiful little orange Penstemon. And this is important because oftentimes, you know, native plants live in all these different areas. Uh, Penstemon and Barbados has an even larger range than this, but each of those collection sites and each of those watersheds where the plant is found, the genetics of that plant are communicating with each other through pollinators in that area. And so if you do live in Douglas, for example, you're gonna wanna maybe grab, you know, ideally you would be able to collect seeds around Douglas and they would do better in that area. This is simply to kind of show the idea of uh, if you're in Tucson and you find some cool plants in your backyard or in a little area by your house, collecting those seeds and growing those out are going to do, you know, so well because the plant has already adapted uh, to that area. So yeah, this is just a way cool map because I love Penstemon and it's neat to see the distribution of how they work across the landscape. And when you think about native plants, especially kind of thinking about where they live and how the seeds are communicating with each other, how the plants are communicating with each other is important. Sí, rapidito aquí, el mapa lo que nos demuestra, si ven los puntos rosas, como rosa fuchsia, es donde están los penstimos barbatus, es una planta muy bonita que tiene unas florecitas muy, pues hay de distintos colores, ¿no? Pero lo más característico es rosa. Y, este, y es donde nos demuestran, pues, dónde, dónde están naciendo, ¿no? A dónde se están moviendo estas plantas. Eh, lo que decía Francesca es que, por ejemplo, en el área de Douglas, Arizona, pues eh, hay que escoger, hay que ir a juntar semillas que estén cerca de ahí porque están mejor adaptadas al clima, ¿no? Este, está muy interesante este mapa. Y ya, a continuar. <laughs> so really quickly, I'm going to go through the next two slides about germinating native seeds specifically. Uh, for the most part, if you have seeds and they look like little seeds, throw them in a pot and put some water on them and they very likely might come up. Um, native seeds are a little bit different than domesticated garden seeds though, because they're not used to working with people. Uh, so they're expecting you know, to have to do their thing in nature, and they're not expecting to work with a human who wants them to survive. Uh, so they don't trust you, <laughs> and they don't trust, uh, you know, they're not all going to germinate at the same time, and they're often going to need special little tricks to get them to even pop up. Aquí lo que nos demuestran las imágenes es cómo van a empezar a, a germinar las, las semillas, ¿no? Este, poniéndolas en su espacio, pero no significa que todas las semillas vayan a, a ser exitosas en germinar, ¿no? Por eso es que hay que tener una buena cantidad. Pero si estamos aquí en casa y si tenemos semillas que juntamos aquí en nuestro jardín, es bueno es hacerlo de una manera sencilla, ponerlo en una... En una este, contenedor de plástico con hoyitos abajo y su tierra y todo y regarla y tarda en distintos periodos para cada semilla no significa que todas vayan a germinar al mismo tiempo so there's two little tricks that we're going to talk about um, just one on each slide um, 
Also, as a heads up, we do offer specific plant propagation classes that are like four hours long because there's so many details. Um, but the two main tricks to getting seeds to germinate if they don't just pop up on their own is scarification and stratification. Uh, these are physical and physiological, physical and physiological dormancies that the seeds go into um, because they're trying to protect themselves and they're trying to find the very perfect time to germinate. So scarification is when you have to do something physical to the seed uh, to get it to germinate. Uh, the picture on the right and the left really are mostly hot water treatments that we use where we boil water and pour boiling water on the seed. Um, after you know a time, the seed then imbibes and kind of takes in the water and then is ready to germinate. And people are so confused by why this would work, but for most scarification methods, there's acid treatments, there's different things that you can do. The plant is trying to wait for enough time to have passed. A mother plant never wants her babies, especially here in the desert, to just grow up right next to her because there's a lack of resources. And so she wants her baby to like over many years, some in some cases, go, you know, go through the streams and get taken in by a flood and like end up someplace far away from her. And then when enough water enters the seed, the baby can actually grow. Wow, casi me haces llorar, Francesca, con esa historia. Escarificación es una técnica uh, para uh, germinar semillas. Eh, algunas de las semillas que nos brindan nuestras plantas del desierto tienen la corteza muy dura, la piel, la capa muy dura. Entonces, lo que se hace en los, um, aquí a un lado, al lado izquierdo, eh, se ve que hay agua, ¿no? Les ponen agua hirviendo para ablandar esa, esa capa dura y así, eh, como quien dice, adelantar el proceso de germinación. Eh, naturalmente estas semillas son duras porque estamos en el desierto y las plantas son muy inteligentes, saben que no van a germinar rápidamente, ¿no? En un año ya, ¡pum! No, o sea, tienen que pasar muchas cosas en la naturaleza para que ciertas semillas puedan germinar. Stratification uh, is the other really fun one uh, that's like people think is so mysterious, but really it's just the seed falling out, you know, I mean, most of our seed collection, most seeds come off in the, in the fall, you know, in the majority of the Sky Island, especially in this area. And you don't wanna germinate in the fall, you're just a little baby plant and then it's gonna freeze on you. And so the plant uh, starts counting and it's really cool how, how seeds do math. Um, but basically what we do to make the plant think that winter has come and gone, um, and sometimes there's hot uh, or warm season stratifications you can do too. We don't do really very many of those because it's so warm in general. Uh, but you put the seeds in a little plastic bag uh, with maybe some peat moss or you can use another sterile media and then some moisture. Uh, you don't want to like keep it soaked, but you want it to, you want the seed to like um, wake up when it, when it feels the moisture. Um, and this allows the seed to think that uh, once it's been in the fridge for, I don't know, we average like six weeks, um, then the plant kind of like wakes up after six weeks and thinks that, um, that winter is gone. Ok, esto está interesante. Eh, las bolsas de plástico es para hacer sentir a la semilla que están pasando el invierno. Eh, aquí en el desierto, pues el invierno no es muy, mmm, ¿cómo se dice? Muy extremo, ¿no? Este, eh, pero las semillas saben que tienen que pasar por un proceso de, de frío. Entonces, eh, son six weeks. Yo sé, Francesca, seis semanas en las que se tiene que pasar, se mete en el refri en todo, con todo y bolsa. Eh, esto es para, es una técnica para algunas semillas, no para todas. Pero sí está interesante. And with that, that brings us to seed collection. All right. Um, so kind of backtracking back to before you're propagating the seeds, um, you're gonna wanna collect your seeds. And the first thing to think about when you're collecting seeds 
is what you're going to collect. So a lot of times we make a target species list. And to make a target species list, you need to ask yourself, what are your needs? So are you planning a pollinator garden and you want to have, you know, a plant with every flower color and every flower shape to attract bees and butterflies and hummingbirds? Or are you planning just to support uh, nectar feeding bats? Or are you planning to do erosion control? And once you kind of know what your needs are, you can target the plants that fit those needs. So the first thing is really thinking about what your needs are and creating a list or like an idea in your head of what you want to collect. Muy bien, aquí vamos a ir por pasos. Ya vamos a empezar con el tema de cosechar semillas. Y la primera pregunta que nos tenemos que hacer es para qué queremos las semillas. Eso es muy importante porque ahí nos vamos a seguir con las distintas técnicas que hay, ¿no? Para, para lograr lo que queremos. Uh, and then the next thing uh, is to, I guess I, this maybe goes in the last slide too, is where to collect. Um, so maybe you're going to collect in your yard or around your neighborhood. Um, and if you're going to collect on public lands or private lands that um, that are not yours, you need to get permission. I just have to say that just so I don't encourage people to go collecting uh, and get in trouble. Um, so sometimes, depending on the situation, if it's public land, you need pretty formal permission. If it's like, you know, forest service, at least if you're collecting more than a certain amount. Um, but if it's like your neighbor's yard, front yard, you can just go over and be like, hey, I want to collect these wildflower seeds. Is that fine? And get verbal permission. Um, and a, a great way to collect is a lot of times in the kind of like public spaces around the neighborhood, you can find a lot of wildflowers in those areas. So figuring out where to collect and you can watch during the bloom season where you're seeing the plants that you want to collect, where they're blooming and then make a mental note of those spots and go back to them when it's time to collect. Bien, aquí estamos hablando de dónde vamos a, a juntar nuestras semillas, a colectarlas. Eh, puede ser en tu propio jardín, puede ser en tu vecindario, o puede ser ya yendo a un parque nacional. Entonces ahí sí ya necesitas permisos, ¿no? Eh, ya este, para ser éticos, ¿no? Y justos con lo que estamos haciendo. Entonces es nada más estar atentos a a dónde vamos a colectarlas y si requerimos de algún permiso o algo. Can we stay in this slide for a sec? Sorry. <laughs> um, this is just a continuation. So the identify your population. Um, so that's the next kind of thing, uh, which goes back to what Francesca was talking about with the Penstemon Barbatus and the distribution, is thinking about how the plants that you want to collect are communicating with each other. Um, which is usually via pollination. So a population is usually um, a group of plants that's sharing genetic information. So you have to think about how a plant is pollinated to, think, to figure out how big the population is. So if a plant is wind pollinated like grasses, the populations can be huge because wind can carry pollen, especially grass pollen that's very light, miles. Um, so it could be you know, thousands and thousands of plants. Whereas maybe this plant, another plant you're collecting is growing in a really small little area um, and it's pollinated by bees. And you have to think about how far a bee can really fly from plant to plant to share the, um, share the to pollinate the plant, share the genetic information in that population. So think about how big is your population, um, about approximate how many plants are in your population. Ok, aquí se trata también de eh, identificar la población de las plantas que vamos a cosechar las semillas, ¿no? Y ver qué tan grande es, eh, es esa población, porque pues no queremos acabar con toda la población de, de cierta planta, por ejemplo, los pénsimos que veíamos hace rato en el mapa. Este, también tenemos que ver si estamos en un área así grande, eh, ver cómo las plantas se están comunicando entre sí y eso se ve, esto yo no lo sabía, lo, lo acabo de aprender apenas, este, eh, cómo se polinizan, ya sea por el viento, ya sea por los polinizadores y ver, por ejemplo, si se están polinizando con abejas, eh, qué tanta distancia puede volar una abejita, ¿no? O sea, es interesante saber todos esos datos. All right, and then um, 
The next thing, this is just a fun slide about how grasses also flower because a lot of people don't know that. <laughs> and grasses are wind pollinated, as I was saying, which is actually, um, you know, this really strong abiotic force uh, that that is what supports our grasslands and is why we have these massive grass populations. Um, and this one's in uh, English and Spanish, so you can read it. Uh, but I have a note for the next slide, actually, which is about the next step in seed collection is watching phenology. So you've identified what you want to collect, you've figured out where you want to collect it, um, and you've figured out about how big the population is, and then you want to watch it. You just want to watch your plants. You want to figure out when they're flowering, and then you want to figure out when they're finishing flowering, and then you want to watch them kind of like drying out and watch their fruits form. And then you want to figure out when they're ready to collect. Aquí esto me gusta porque ya está más cerca de lo que hago yo aquí en mi jardín, en mi casa. Pues es, es ya una vez que ya vemos, ok, que para qué quiero semillas, qué voy a hacer con ellas, en qué planta voy a agarrar, cuál es la población. Este, pues ver el proceso de la planta, ¿no? Este ver cómo se está reproduciendo, que okay, ya salió la florecita, ya se ya se polinizó, ya está el fruto, ver todo esa ese proceso de la vida de la planta y nada más estar esperando así para cuando ya haya semillas. So this is just a fun slide illustrating what we were, what we were talking about. So like watch your plant and this is a really cool slide of the agave just starting to form its stock. Francesca took these pictures at our nursery. I think she took one like every day or at least once a week as the stock was going up. And then the picture on the left is once the stock was flowering. So this is just keep an eye. You want to watch very carefully to kind of like watch what the plant is doing. Así es. Eh, lo más importante de todo esto de colectar semillas es observar observar la planta y aquí está un ejemplo perfecto. Eh, Francesca se tomó el tiempo de tomar varias fotos en distintos días de este agave hasta que ya uh, se abrió la flor, bueno, las flores, <laughs> muchas flores. All right, and then, so this is really just to illustrate kind of, um, plants in flower and then those same plants in seed. Um, so in their different stages. And one of the important things to consider when you're observing your um, plant phenology when they're flowering is to consider kind of our seasons here in Southern Arizona and how the flowering follows the season. So here we have two rainy seasons. We have a cool, you know, like winter rain, hopefully. And then we have a summer rain also, hopefully. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't happen. Um, and usually flowering follows rains. So we usually think about our plants here as cool season plants or warm season plants. Cool season plants do most of their growing in the fall and winter, um, and then they bloom in the early, late winter, early spring after the winter rains, and then maybe a month or so later in the late spring, early summer, they're going to seed. And that desert globe mallow there is one you've seen all around Tucson, I'm sure, blooming in the spring often, even it has a long bloom period, but you usually first see it in the spring. Um, and then the picture above it is its little seed pods when they're actually ready to collect and they're all dried out. And similarly with our um, warm season plants is they do most of their growing in the spring and summer. And then after the big monsoon rains, they bloom and then they go to seed in the fall, uh, which is like, uh, which is the situation for the rubber rabbit brush which in the upper right hand corner, it's in flower and the lower right hand corner, it's going to seed. So you can see it's lost its color and it's gotten kind of fluffy and dried out. Aquí en Tucson tenemos uh, dos temporadas de lluvia, uh, a veces, <laughs> pero eh, se supone que debe de llover en invierno y en el verano. Eh, entonces las plantas de aquí pues ya están adaptadas a eso, ¿no? Y aquí a la izquierda vemos el desert low malo que lo, yo lo conozco por mal de ojo, eh, eh, que en primavera es cuando florece, aunque puede florecer casi todo el año, dependiendo de 
que tanto frío haga y ahí arriba se pueden ver ya las semillas, las flores secas, las semillas eh, ahí. Y el, la otra planta, esa no sé cómo se dice en español, pero creo que le dicen chamizo, no estoy segura. Eh, que también este, florea después de las lluvias de verano y, y ya se ve seco eh, con semillas a finales del año. Cool. Yeah, so like, what are the spring blooming plants where you live and where do they grow? And what are the fall blooming plants where you live and where do they grow? Um, so once you've kind of watched the plants flower and dry out and they're getting ready to go to seed, you want to be able to recognize what we call the natural state of dispersal, which is when the plant is ready to let go of its seeds. You want to collect the seeds when the embryo is fully developed. So like Francesca was saying, the plant spent all this time making nectar and being pollinated and growing these babies. And you don't want to collect them until the plant is like ready to let go of them, um, which can be tricky in the case of this milkweed here, where you know that the seeds are ready when the pods open, but once the pod is open, they fly away very quickly. So sometimes your window is like kind of short. Este es un ejemplo del algodoncillo, eh, Mil Whitley, estamos acá en, en Estados Unidos. Este, y lo que dice Perin es que tenemos que esperar el momento preciso en el que las semillas ya estén listas para colectarlas, ¿no? En la foto izquierda vemos que ahí están las semillas y podrían estar listas ya, pero tenemos que esperar a que ya naturalmente la planta diga, ok, ahí les va, ahí les va mis mis hijitos, ¿no? Mis semillas. Entonces, esa es parte de la observación que estamos hablando eh, y es, esto es lo que se le llama el estado natural de dispersión de las semillas. So we have a little video. I'm going to play maybe the first part and then um, fast forward to the end because we're running a little behind time. Sounds like the video is not working, um, so we're going to skip ahead. But we can share that video link um, in the follow-up email that we're going to send. So, el video no está trabajando, perdón, pero la podemos mandar en el correo electrónico. All right, so skipping ahead, maybe we can watch it later or send it out. Um, but basically, the whole point is just to recognize when your plants are ready to um, let go of their seed and you want to collect them when they're ripe. Otherwise, they're, it's wasted seed. Um, and then the, the other important thing to consider when doing seed collection is um, ethics of harvest. And here is just this little section called The Honorable Harvest from Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, which I think is very beautiful. Um, and it really just sums up everything really nicely. Um, we also use the Bureau of Land Management Seeds of Success programs protocols, which get very specific. Um, our, very simply, our rules are never collect more than 20% of what is available in a given population. So that's where your, your population is important. And never take more than 50% of what's available on a single individual plant. Um, you always wanna leave some, you wanna, always wanna assume that somebody, some creature has taken some before you and somebody will come and take some after you and you want to leave a little for the plant to be able to regenerate itself. Of course, if it's in your yard, 
and you're like, I don't want this to seed anywhere. You can take all the seed. Um, but if you want it to reseed itself and grow and actually be able to spread maybe within your neighborhood, it's always good to leave some. Sí, básicamente aquí es eh, pues tener consideración de, de los demás, ¿no? Incluyendo aquí también a los animalitos, a los pajaritos que se pueden alimentar de ciertas semillas de las plantas y no acaparar con dejar pelón a la planta, ¿no? Sin semillas, eso no es ético. Eh, este es un extracto del libro Braiding Sweetgrass. Es como un poema, lo veo yo y está muy bonito. Eh, y con mucha razón eh, seguir estos estos um, pasos éticos. And then uh, you want to get collecting. <laughs> so this is just a slide that basically shows some of the really basic tools that we use a lot when we do seed collection. Five gallon buckets are fantastic. Uh, paper bags are great. Some garden snips and gloves are always useful and always a pen for writing down information like Francesca mentioned. Um, a lot of the techniques that we use oftentimes are just hand, hand stripping. So like with a grass, for example, you might have a long inflorescence and you just take it with your hand and strip upwards and then put your seed into your bag or your bucket. Um, and we do a lot of uh, just manual collecting, like you know, gently pulling on seed heads or, um, or sometimes we snip inflorescences, like for a penstemon, for example, when you have a bunch of upward facing pods and it's totally dried out. Um, and if you knock it, it, a lot of times you knock seeds everywhere. So sometimes you might take uh, a section of that, of that stock, like maybe half of it, and then you dump it up, upside down into your bag or your bucket. Um, and then for writing down information, it's always great. We take really detailed notes, but it's always useful to write what you're collecting, so the name of the plant, so you know, the date, so you know when you collected it, and the location. Um, those are probably the three most important bits of information. Um, and then the one other thing, I mentioned this in the video, uh, so, but I'll just quickly touch on it. There are some species that um, will do an after ripening. It's only really asters, uh, so it's not super common, but a lot of asters you can actually collect when they're done flowering, but before the seeds are ripe, you just have to collect the entire seed heads. So thistles, for example, a lot of times we will collect the seed heads once the flowers are closed and they're dry, and then you just leave them in, an, you know, laid out on a tarp or in a, in a screen. And then once they like fluff out and are super dry, you can actually like stomp them and get the seeds out of the seed heads. Or in other cases, uh, for non-thistles, sometimes you don't need to stomp them. So sometimes that's a that's really useful to have the snips for after ripening seeds. Este es el material que que Francesca y Perín usan para colectar a uh, semillas cuando van al campo. Eh, muy fácil a uh, colectar en una cubeta de esas con unas. Um, tengo yo las mías. Eh, las bolsas de papel y el charpi, el plumón y los guantes, muy importante. Eh, eh, pero el plumón es para, como decimos, de, dijimos hace rato, eh, anotar de dónde sacaste las semillas, en qué área estuviste, qué semillas de qué planta es, porque luego se nos olvida. Y este, de tanta emoción ¿no? de andar afuera ahí. Y este... ¿Qué más? Hay distintas maneras o en, con distintas plantas, por ejemplo, los, eh, no agarré bien el nombre de las plantas esas, as, ascardos, eh, que nada más se le corta la, la flor seca y ahí trae la semilla, pero toma un tiempo más en, en que se seque. Y entonces, ya cuando te lo llevas a tu casa, ya va a estar lista, ¿no? Eh, pero para eso son las, las bolsas de papel para echar todo ese material. Oh, and then, oh, yes. Yeah. So, one more note, kind of transitioning to this slide, is when you're transporting your seeds, uh, never leave them in the car. It's very easy to forget them. And in Tucson, 
you know, even in October, it's like that second summer, you will just bake your seeds. So don't forget them in the car. Um, and ideally don't put them in like a sealed plastic bag, especially in the car because the humidity difference, um, it can be really bad for the seed. It can get them to rot, especially if there's any uh, like non-seed plant material in there. Um, so then the next step is like kind of pre-processing. So before you're like cleaning your seeds, we always want to lay them out to let bugs crawl out. That's it. That's super important. And to let them dry out. So if you've stuffed a lot of seed in a paper bag, you want to kind of like decompact it, let it fluff out, put it on maybe a hanging tray, like in the picture on the right. Um, or if the seeds are really small or the collection small, turkey trays work really well. Um, and if the collection's bigger, a tarp on the ground works really great. And you just want to spread your seed out in a thin layer. Um, and let bugs crawl out and let it dry out for a week or two. Fans can help and dehumidifiers are also, also really helpful for getting it really dry. Although in Arizona, it's not, you know, it's not a huge issue, just, just during monsoon season. Ok, aquí estamos hablando de cuando ya tenemos las semillas y ya las vamos a llevar en el carro, no se les olvide, no las vayan a dejar en el carro eh, porque bueno, si viven aquí en Tucson, hay, hace mucho calor y se van a tostar y se van a echar a perder. Entonces no queremos que todo ese esfuerzo, ¿no? De la planta, tanto de la planta como tanto de nosotros de ir y colectar semillas, pues se quede echado a perder ahí en el carro caliente. Eh, esa es una. La otra es, el, las bolsas de papel son muy buenas para que no se junte humedad en las semillas. Y este, porque la humedad es el peor enemigo de las semillas que están guardadas, ¿no? Entonces, si están pensando en llevar las Ziploc, las bolsitas de plástico, no, no son buenas. Eh, también el, los abanicos, si viven en un lugar que es muy húmedo aquí en pues, Arizona, no, no sufrimos de humedad. Solamente en los um, meses del monsoon, pero no mucho. Eh, pero bueno, los abanicos ayudan a mantener esa humedad fuera de, de las bolsas de las, con las semillas. Entonces se tienen que mantener en un lugar seco. Eh, y, y el otro aparato que está ahí es un deshumidificador que también ayuda si viven en lugares con mucha humedad. So then you want to clean your seeds, which for different purposes, there's different levels of cleaning. A lot of times it's like how clean do the seeds really need to be? Um, if you're using them at home, a lot of times you can just get rid of big twigs and leaves and like big material that's not seed and then just throw the seeds in a pot. It like doesn't need to be um, super clean, but it can be useful if you're going to store them for maybe a couple years before you want to use your seed. Um, and so cleaning is really just separating seeds from non-seed plant parts, so like twigs and leaves, which we call chaff. Um, and that prevents rot when that organic material breaks down. And the easiest methods and like tried and true methods are really, really simple screens like you see on the right there, um, separating, separating all the seed and non-seed stuff by size. Um, and then winnowing can be useful for really fine debris and that separates by weight. So you can see that on the, um, on the left there when you use air and you kind of like bounce your seeds or use a fan and pour the seeds. You have to be careful not to blow your seeds away, of course. Um, other great, great at-home seed cleaning um, methods are a kitchen sieve that you might use, like a little a strainer, um, or tweezers are really useful for picking out small pieces. Um, but in general, you want to ask yourself, how clean is clean enough? And is it you know, oftentimes it's fine to have the seed to have some plant material in it. Um, and sometimes you don't want your seed to be super perfectly clean because uh, insects apparently really like to carry it away more when it's cleaner. So the big, the big picture is getting rid of big pieces of plant like twigs and leaves. Y cuando colectamos ciertas semillas se vienen con todo y material, pues, aparte, ¿no?, de las florecitas secas y de otras hojitas. Entonces, aquí se trata de qué tan limpias queremos tener nuestras semillas. Y esto es más que nada recomendado si quieres tener 
estas semillas guardadas por años, ¿no? Eh, no sé cuál sea tu propósito, eh, pero una idea buena es con, como está en la imagen, con un abanico, este, para que las semillas caigan al suelo y todo lo demás, toda la basurita se vaya volando, ¿no? Eh, otra manera es, son los coladores esos que se pueden hacer o incluso hasta coladores de, que usamos en la cocina o con pincitas, ¿no? Agarrar nuestras semillas. Um, pero pues muchas veces es importante ese material orgánico que se viene con todo y las semillas porque eso evita que ciertos animalitos, ciertos bichos eh, lleguen directo y se coman la semilla nada más se entretienen ahí buscando la semilla y comiéndose las basuritas. Entonces, mucha limpieza en este caso no es muy recomendable. Eh, otra cosa que quería decir a, en, la, en el, lo anterior que hablábamos de las bolsas de plástico, yo estoy viendo aquí mis bolsas y pues aquí tengo esta bolsa de plástico y eso está mal, ¿no? Ya me di cuenta. Y pues pensando en cómo las semillas que venden así en papelitos, eh, si no van a juntar muchas semillas, este, pues sobrecitos así de papel que haga cada quien, eso es muy bueno también, ¿no? Dependiendo, yo aquí en mi jardín eso es lo que hago, compro papelitos, sobrecitos de papel y, y ahí guardo mis semillas, ¿no? Viéndolo en escala a chica. <risa> And then, oh, this is just a picture of cleaning with screens. Yeah, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, we do, you can see that we do some really massive collections and then some smaller collections. Also, Christiane was also sharing that, she was showing the little envelopes that she uses for collecting seeds in her garden. Um, so for just home use, you can just use the little, um, you can make one out of paper or you can buy little small ones to use for your own personal garden. All right, so the final thing is seed storage. If you're not gonna store, or sorry, if you're not going to sow your seeds right away, which I recommend, I think they do really well when you, when you like collect them and then try to propagate them. I love doing that, but it's very useful to wait until maybe the next season. Um, and so if you're going to store your seeds, depending on how long you're going to store them, um, you want to you wanna set them up so they'll stay viable for as long as possible. Um, and so the three pillars for seed storage are cool, dark, dry. That's really all you need to know. So you think about um, pantries and where we store food, like beans or rice or any kind of dried goods, which are oftentimes seeds. It's the same conditions. You want to store them in a cool, dark, dry place where no pests can get to. So no mice, no insects. But that's really the most important part of seed storage. This slide shows some examples of how we store our seeds. So we dry them down like really low humidity and then we put them in heat sealed plastic like food grade. And that just helps when you're like taking them in and out of storage that the humidity levels aren't adjusting. But a lot of times we store them in just manila envelopes, kind of like uh, what Christian was just showing, but a bigger version. And then we put them in a little like Tupperware and we have a walk-in cold storage area. So it's useful to have them in the fridge if you wanna store them for longer, but you don't wanna have it be humid. So you wanna put them in something where the, where the humidity isn't gonna change. But it's also fine to just put them in a container that's in like a cupboard or pantry situation. So just cool and dark, as long as it can be protected from mice and insects. Sí, aquí este, bueno, ya pusieron las semillas en, en bolsas de plástico, pero ya están secas. Esto es para cuando vas a guardar tus semillas por un buen rato, ¿no? Por años. Eh, las, los tres pilares básicos para conservar semillas es que los pongas en un lugar que esté fresco, frío, que esté oscuro y que esté seco. Básicamente eso es lo que necesitas. Eh, como cuando, donde guardamos nuestros alimentos, ¿no? Este, para que no se echen a perder rápido, es la misma cosa. Jobs. That was, yeah, first of all, excellent work, Perrin and Christian. Christian, we want to hire you for all of our translation I needs. Know. You're so, like, yeah, you're, that was really fun. Yeah, you did such a great job. 
Before we get into questions, we want to do a big shout out for we're, we're doing a big um, hiring effort for this fall where we're going to be hiring like 10 people for a temporary uh, job that are paid 16 and then $17 respectively, depending on if you're a lead or uh, a seed collection tech. Um, the information is on our website at borderlandsrestoration.org. Um, and there's housing, there's like bunk housing, um, because it's often hard for people to move to Patagonia and find housing for the short term work. Um, but yeah, we collect hundreds of pounds of seed and Perrin is uh, in charge of all of our seed collection. Um, and it's a really wonderful, impressive effort. Um, so if you want to be a part of it, because this is probably the last year we're going to have this super big contract, because um, it's exhausting. Yeah, yeah. Joaquin, Joaquin, yeah. We'll hire Joaquin. And Christian. And Christian. <laughs> Cream team. Um, but yeah, like, so spread the word also, even if you're not interested personally, if you know someone who would be a good fit, um, we really want people that care about seeds and are excited about the work. So we figured we'd throw it to this group that signed up for the class. But yeah, thank you. And um, yeah, turn it over to Cindy and for questions or whatever. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Um, aquí están este, diciendo que, que van a hacer un trabajo muy grande y quieren, este, este, quieren ver si alguien está interesado en trabajando con ellos, así que hay más información en su sitio de web. Aquí tenemos unos libros um, para identificar las plantas. We have some books for identifying plants. These are recommended by Cristian, I believe. Um, these are what she uses to identify plants in, um, in her garden. And we will um, be sharing some more resources. Also, um, definitely want to pull the audience. If you have um, websites or things that you use for helping to identify your plants, please put them in the chat. Um, si tienen este, unos ideas, como unos sitios de web, como identificar las plantas, este, también lo pueden poner en el chat. Y les queremos las gracias. We want to thank you all. Um, this uh, class was part of um, the BYOB effort that Watershed Management Group put together, the Build Your Own Basin. And so the reason why I wanted to do this class is because part of the BYOB program was um, to get the community to donate um, plants um, by taking a little cactus pup or things from, from their garden and sharing it with other people in the community. And so we're hoping that by sharing this information about how to collect seeds, um, you can go out in your garden and collect seeds now, and then you can share it with um, other people in the community. Um, we're gonna be relaunching our BYOB, our Build Your Own Basin program in the fall. And so now's a great time to start thinking about collecting seeds so that you can share seeds from your garden with your family, your friends, and other people in Tucson as well. So thank you so much. Um, muchas gracias. Vamos a tener poquito tiempo para preguntas, um, pero no tanto, así que si se pueden quedar después del tiempo, aquí vamos a tener este tiempo para preguntas. We do have some time for questions. I know a lot of people have some very specific questions about their plants at home, so we're going to do our best. If you can stay over um, the time, since we're almost at 6.30, we'll have some time for Q&A. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to our presenters. We have lots of things going on in the chat right now, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, I was scared to click on the chat because I, I didn't want to lose anything on the PowerPoint. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sharing and then we'll, we'll jump over to the chat. Lots of thank yous. Yes, thank you, thank you for being here. Okay. So if you want, you can unmute yourself and you can ask your question yourself. Uh, I'll be scrolling through and see what I can find and ask our presenters. Okay, here's a question. Are there any recommended comprehensive reference materials to describe seeds from Southwest native plants, including what time of year seeds are best collected and physical appearance of seeds from a particular species? Pregunta. Uh, 
Um, that's super tricky. I think there's like very little resources on where to find a picture of seed. I mean, I always say like Sinet or southwestbiodiversity.org um, is like fantastic. I use that all the time. And sometimes there's pictures of seeds, but usually it's herbarium vouchers. So like pressed plants. It's really hard to find like good images of seeds that you can like search by species. Uh, you could also check though the Native Plant Network. Um, they at least have, it's like uh, sourced from all different nurseries like and different you know, propagation people. Uh, and it's like how it's like propagation tips for native plants in the Southwest. Um, but that can be helpful for seed propagation. I don't know if they have photos of seeds on there, but that's worth a look too. <laughs> yeah. I can't think of anything else, honestly. Yeah, we don't have a good comprehensive book that we use. Um, and honestly, I don't know, we Google stuff all the time, even for propagating things. We start, you know, we'll like ask another nursery or talk to a friend, but also like just Google it and see what you can find. Um, but yeah, we don't have like a big reference for seeds. Maybe we can look at that. Yeah. Could you, um, could you tell me like when is a good time to plant desert marigolds and like tansy aster seeds? Like, is now a good time to sow them in the ground or no? <laughs> um, I mean, it's a, uh, you, you could really sow seeds whenever you are ready to do it. The problem with sowing desert marigold is that it's a cool season plant. Um, so you won't see it for a, quite a while. Uh, that's one that, like, needs, you know, wants, like, a little bit of a cool overwinter season, even though it's in the low desert. Um, but... Yeah, ideally you could put it in the ground now. It just, it might be uh, carried off by insects. So you'd want to like water it and get it to grow. And then you wouldn't actually see it flower for a while, maybe next spring. Uh, for tansy aster. So it might be better to wait till the fall. Yeah, that's what I would do, is wait till the fall. Um, and then tansy aster you could do now. That's usually more of a warm season plant. And that'll like bloom in the fall. At least where we are, it blooms in the fall. So okay, that, think, thank you. Tansy aster. Yo tengo una pregunta. Eh, ¿Qué tipo de, de semillas son las que se refrigeran? Uh, ¿Como para la estratificación o para...? Pero, sí, o sea, ¿qué tipo de, de semillas son las que se pueden incorporar pues al, al, al la refrigeración porque hay semillas mencionaron que hay semillas que no se meten a, en refrigeración pero cuáles sí son las que son viables para el, el refrigerio pues puedes meter para um, para el, para el storage para um, how do you say storage para guardarlo Sí, si, si, si lo quieres guardar, puedes meter a cualquier semilla al refri para guardarlo. Um, solo necesita estar seca. Um, para propagación, para, para la estratificación, cuando le pones como con un poco de tierra y agua um, y luego lo metes al refri para sacarlo, muchas veces lo haces con plantas como el penstemon, como, como plantas así. Um, que necesitan un periodo de, de uh, um. <laughs> frío, <laughs> que les gusta el frío. El frío. <laughs> el mejor de, uh, de estratificación es, es mejor por plantas um, uh, ma maderosas, like woody, uh -huh. Con, uh, de madera. y plantas que crecen en altituros, altituras más altas, Y también por plantas que flor, uh, florecen en la primavera. Pero para guardar es, es bueno para todos. Si lo, si lo puedes poner seco. Um, for storing seeds in the fridge, you can store any seeds in the fridge as long as it's dry enough for them. And then for propagation, for like cold stratification, where you put them in a little baggie with like some water and some um, uh, peat, yeah, some like soil. 
medium. Uh, that's like good for woody plants. Um, high elevation plants. High, high elevation plants. <laughs> spring blooming. <laughs> spring blooming plants. The penstemons often need that in our neck of the woods. That works really well for penstemons. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Gracias, Yasmin. Gracias. Here's another one. Hi. Oh, question. Question. oh, yes, go for it. Mm -hmm. May I? Well, okay. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this presentation. It's very exciting. Primero, muchas gracias por la presentación. Está super emocionante. Um, I would like to know something about ethical collection of a specific plant that is my favorite desert plant, the ocotillo plant. Uh, mi pregunta es de la, la recolección ética de plantas, en específico el ocotillo, que es mi favorita y sé que está protegida por lo menos en este lado. Yo estoy hablando de Mexicali. I know it's a, also a protected plant. I'm, I'm, I'm here from Mexicali. And I would like to know if, if Christian knows that, uh, what applies here in Mexico. Vamos a ver si Christian sabe de qué aplica acá porque estoy muy... Gracias. Ándale, cachanilla como yo. <laughs> Salud. Salud, salud. Con agua, claro. Mm. Híjole, del cocotillo. He tratado. Cuando voy allá a mi rancho, allá donde está mi familia, ahorita están en Ciudad Constitución, en Baja California Sur. Este, he tratado de agarrar semillas de ocotillo y no se me ha hecho porque no voy en el tiempo adecuado. Entonces, ahorita me voy para allá. Entonces, me pregunto, no he, no he visto. Francesca, pero... do you know about ocotillo propagation? For propagation, uh, the seeds don't store very well. Um, uh, But, that, you know, that's what we've always heard. We used an accession that was a few years old and it worked pretty well. But for the most part, they say with Ocotillo to sow it right away um, as soon as you collect it. And they pop up really well. Uh, very, very easy to propagate. No stratification. No, the cleaning is very, very easy, very straightforward. They take forever to grow. Son muy, muy difíciles para crecer. And that's... Um, Yeah, that's a, that's a big problem. Um, also, Angela, I'm from Calexico. I grew up in Calexico. Oh, Messina. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, but yeah, we love, and I don't know, I also love growing Acatillo from seed. We have a bunch, but they're like three years old. And especially here where it's colder, they're like this big. Um, so one day when we sell them, it'll be like $800 for Acatillo. <laughs> No. Okay. Lo mismo para para terminarlo, lo mismo que explicaron. It's the same that you explained to Germany. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias. We have a question from Marty. Can you say more about your nursery? Do you sell to the public? And I know that you just had your big plant sale, so. Is there any um, events that you want to throw out there? Anything coming up or are you all done for the season? No, thank you. That's so nice. We feel bad like pushing our, we're trying to fund our program all the time, you know. Uh, but for a long time, um, the as a nonprofit, we didn't have the licensing to retail our seeds. And as of uh, this year, we do, which is really exciting. And uh, we are open a lot uh, these days. So our hours are Tuesday through Saturday, uh, Tuesday through Friday, it's nine to noon. And then on Saturdays, it's 10 to one. And you can find our inventory of plants and seed at borderlandsplants.org. Uh, hey, what happened? Like just, oh. just, um, okay. our website like a few days ago, which is really exciting. Um, but also like come visit and if you, yeah, wanna, Come say hi. We, we're in a town of 900 people um, and are so excited to be vaccinated and to have people out at the nursery and to, um, yeah, just like talk to people about plants and 
If any of you are interested in starting your own native plant program or a nursery or seed collection, we love encouraging people to collect and grow more plants because we really just think that um, so many more people need to learn and get excited about native plants in the first place. So we don't have any kind of weird like competitive stuff. Uh, there's so many great nurseries in the area um, that you should check out. We're really lucky in Southern Arizona, but we're also really encouraging of uh, especially uh, our partners like the Colectivo Sonora Silvestre and other groups in Sonora that are starting up nurseries were just so supportive and um, are always looking for like grants and funds to send people's ways. We do a lot of grant writing, um, but yeah, please buy our seeds or our plants because it helps support our time. Um, but yeah, if you, if you have any questions, we're very supportive of native plants. <laughs> I have a question. Um, so uh, what I was wondering is once you put a seed in a, a little pot and it sprouts up and so on, so how long do you wait before planting it into the ground? So you don't really want to mess with a seedling until uh, it has true leaves. Uh, so the first little fake things green things that a seed usually puts out are little cotyledons. And then once a seed has true leaves, um, it has usually at that point a better root system and it can be moved around and transplanted. Um, depending on how uh, protective you are in your gardening style, if you have, you know, if you can really keep an eye and keep water and have like a protected spot for a little baby plant to go uh, in the ground, you can transplant them in the ground. Um, but usually, you know, you'd wait for the plant to be, like even if you're gonna put it in a three inch pot, you want the plant to be like, you know, yay big and have a nice little root ball. Um, you also wanna be careful with transplanting where you're transplanting it. So if you grew a plant in shade, in heavy shade, and then stick it right out into the sun, the sun, the, often the plant freaks out and often dies. So being careful about how you stage, how the plant moves. Um, but yeah, I don't know, generally once they have their true leaves, um, Often when it's just cotyledons, you have to be really careful. And uh, even in propagation, moving them around because they, they won't make it even in really good conditions. Thanks. Are there any native plants that germinate well in disrupted, compacted soils and are useful for creating habitat in the city? Question from Mike. Um, I mean, it's amazing where like where seeds will germinate. Um, for air, like yeah, for areas to put like I don't know areas to seed in the city. Um, something that we are really excited about, and it's been mentioned in a bunch of like gorilla gardening books. Um, but is the whole seed ball thing, if you've gotten into seed balls at all. And we pelletize and make seed balls out of a lot of seed. That's what parent has been doing a lot lately. Um, and we have, there's some really cool um, references for that on our website from Elise Gornish's lab that they put together. But basically you're taking seed and you're mixing, you, you talk about the seed balls. Oh, since you well, basically you take seed and you mix it with, there's all different ratios you can do, but basically you put uh, a lot more clay, and we use a little bit of diatomaceous earth and mulch, so basically DE to uh, kind of like discourage predation, because that's one of the biggest things if you're just broadcasting your seed, like bear, is like 80% of, of it can get carried off by insects and birds and stuff. So the idea with the seed balls is that you're protecting it, um, preventing predation, and then when the conditions are right for it, for the plant to actually like germinate and grow, uh, which usually means moisture, then the seed pellet, like the clay and stuff will dissolve and then there will be a nice like media for the seed to germinate in. Um, and that's really nice mostly because so often we have people coming to us being like, um, I wanna plant, you know, oftentimes not in gardens where, when they don't have irrigation and they wanna plant in like May and June, <laughs> uh, which is just like, oh, that's a terrible idea. It's the <laughs> hottest, driest season of the year and if you don't have any way to water it like your plants are going to die and so the seed ball idea is like 
kind of like the long game where you can spread them out and when the timing is right, then the seeds can actually like germinate. But in the meantime, they can just sit on the landscape and be protected. So it, it gives you a much like wider window for when to put seed down. And as far as species for like, ooh, dry compacted soils in the city. And <laughs> uh, Celia. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think always it's like looking around at what grows, um, you know, in like abandoned lots and roadsides and then just like, and what is native that's growing there. So ideally you're not, you know, don't collect <laughs> fountain grass and bubble grass. Uh, know, know what you're collecting. Yeah, thistles are great. Tansy Aster that somebody mentioned earlier, at least where we are, that one's like really great. Anything that you would Oh, hey, can we use your um, Meaning that it germinates quickly, establishes quickly, and like reseeds profusely. That's like, all, those are always good ones to pick. And usually you can like look at sites where you might see um, plants that are growing in like poor conditions and then just like replicate that. But yeah, like brittle bush. Um, Even the pensum and peri, I would probably do great. Yeah. All the roadside stuff, um, they pick really good species. Asclepia subulata. Yeah, there you go. The desert milkweed, mm -hmm. that'd be a great one. But making, you know, it's so hard to get stuff sown into an area unless you can really cultivate it. And the seed balls are awesome. And they're gaining in popularity for restoration work as well. Um, and like the first time I read about it was in like high school in a gorilla gardening book. <laughs> so it's like really fun to see how stuff is working over time. The dahlias are great. Like you guys have uh, dahlia pulchra and also like the little fairy duster. I feel like those ones are pretty solid. Yeah. <laughs> the great list, Perrin. <laughs> I'm like trying to rack my brain, think of what else. Oh yeah, de desert gold grows really well here in Tucson. I mean, you see it on the curbs and just growing all over the place. Nobody's watering them. Uh, this seems to grow really well. That's a great species. <laughs> yeah, I like those. <laughs> Here's a question from Sarah. Please share the best method for sowing wildflower seeds in a rain basin timing and soil depth. So for sowing seed, when, when people aren't gonna pelletize seed, we usually recommend that you would sow with the rain, sow with the rains, and then you would want to rake, um, either rake your, your seeds in. If it's in like a rock basin, you'd want to cover it with a little bit of mulch to protect the, the seeds. Um, and then really just like, you know, pray for rain and let nature take its course. Um, a big problem that people often encounter when direct sowing seed is predation. And we've had seed go out that does really, really well in people's yards and some people that have like, a massive ant hill <laughs> and their ants are just really aggressive and like eat all their seeds and especially with the drought that we've had over the last year or so uh it's been brutal on plants and seeds both in the wild and in people's yards uh but when when we talk to people about sowing wildflower seed we say so with the rain add a little bit of mulch and rake it in a little bit but when you're even like when you're propagating or you're putting seeds out um direct sowing in the landscape uh, you don't want to bury the seed too much unless it's like a larger seed. And often if it is like a big walnut seed or something, uh, squirrels, you know, plant them everywhere. So if you plant like tree seeds around, you want to bury them. A nice rule of thumb that we use is twice as deep as the, the diameter of the seed um, for like pot propagation when you're propagating stuff in containers. Um, so wildflower seed is so tiny. So you just want to like spread it out, barely kind of rake it in mostly to protect it, but the plant doesn't want to be like put in a trench the way that a lot of ag, you know, agriculture crop seeds want to be like put in the ground. Um, wildflower seeds are pretty, pretty forgiving. What you say? Yeah. That's good. All right, we'll probably do one more question. Uh, thank you so much. Baron and Francesca for hanging around and answering all the questions. So let's see. 
Does anyone want to unmute and ask their question? Because uh, there's a lot in the chat here, so I'm scrolling and scrolling. <laughs> How do you get better germination rates for mallows, globe mallow? Um, for globe, I mean, for direct sowing, um, mallows are pretty straightforward. Uh, yeah, they've been easy for us to propagate. I'd say if you're having a problem sowing mallow seed and it isn't working, like in the ground, in the landscape, uh, either check, you know, how old the seed is, or um, you might have like a serious predation issue. But if other stuff comes up and the mallow doesn't come up, I don't know, that's super, super sketch, very, I don't know what to say about that. For, for propagating it in pots, I mean, one thing you could do with the mallow is like put it in a pot, get it to germinate, and then transplant it out. Um, even mallows with little cuttings do super well, where you like, you know, can just buy a little like powder hormone it, Home Depot or something and just like put a little bit, you know, make a little cut on a soft piece of stem and they root so easily. We love mallows. They're so fun to work with. Um, yeah, we haven't done any seed treatments for mallows and haven't had an issue, but I would say like with anything, um, your germination rate also will depend on your seed quality. So that means how ripe was the seed when you collected it? Was it already buggy? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> or was it uh, stored well? And all that stuff will affect your collection and then how well the seed actually grows. So maybe if you're having seed that like doesn't do very well, especially if you're over sowing it a little bit, like say you're over sowing it 100% and you want three, three plants and you do six, or maybe you do more, more than 100% um, and, you're, and you're not getting anything and you've tried that same collection, like go and try collecting some more the next, you know, try collecting later, or just change, you know, changing up what, what you're doing with um, the seed that you're getting or trying just a new batch of seed. Because sometimes it just might be not good seed. Yeah. And I don't know, with any propagation issues or seeding issues, we always just tell people to keep trying. Uh, we've had so many failures and plants that didn't come up, seeds that didn't work. Um, I had like the hardest time germinating lemon sage, the salvia lemoniae. And then we tried a different seed source and it worked really well, where I was like trying all these different things and felt like I was doing a horrible job. And sometimes, you know, the stuff germinates and then dies and don't beat yourself up. Keep trying the pollinators and the landscape will appreciate you continuing to try. The plants will forgive you. <laughs> it's okay. All right, well, I wanna thank uh, all of you for joining us. Um, uh, check out um, Watershed Management Group. Um, watershedmg.org backslash BYOB. We're gonna be relaunching in the fall. So please collect your seeds now and share with your friends and neighbors in Tucson. Um, we just learned all of these awesome techniques from Perrin, Francesca and Christian. So please put your knowledge into action and start collecting your seeds to share with your neighbors. Um, and thank you to Perrin, Francesca and Christian for translating.